Now, this is a nice little challenge. I'm not sure where it came from. Um, and I was just reflecting on, on the climate forecasting research that I started to work in in 1991, uh, courtesy of the precursor to uh, GRDC, I think AWI, Australian Weed Institute, working up in Toowoomba with the Absaroo Group, which was, um, which was a wonderful opportunity. So my little talk is, is the principles of short and medium term climate forecasting and what's driving our climate and how accurate have this been. As I usually like to say, this, the principles of short and medium term forecasting usually takes about six hours, so, um, so you're lucky you're getting the 20 minute version. And, uh, and by the end of 20 minutes, you can probably pick up a lot of this quite quickly. I'll start with this slide. And it's uh, after some, uh, uh, um, a table that uh, Holger Meinke and I put together some years ago. It says management decisions on many scales and there are climate systems operating on many scales as well. So the way you read this is to look at the, at the right hand side of, the, um, of this, this um, little figure here and there you can see a list of most of the patterns that cause uh, climate variability and a little bit of climate change in this part of the world. On the left hand side, very nicely, we've got some examples of decisions that might fit into these various sort of scales, these sort of time scales. So during this talk, I'll show you a few, um, it'll be full of uh, little maps and wiggly lines and so on, I'll try to go through. As we do in the climate uh, world, I'll concentrate mostly on the climate mechanisms and leave it to, to Peter or others to talk about decisions that might fit with them. However, what you can see there as you go down the list uh, are a range of climate systems, starting with intraseasonal, which is uh, about 30 to 50 days, within a month or so, well, a month or so within a three month period. And that's associated with um, commonly something commonly called the Madden Julian Oscillation that some of you have heard of, perhaps. The big one is the seasonal pattern, which is listed there as half a year to a year. It mostly or entirely almost operates at a yearly basis. And this is associated with, with the um, infamous El Nino and La Ninas, which operate, tend to operate from autumn to autumn. So the climate year, by and large, runs roughly June to May, a bit like the financial year, not January to December. So if you're looking at patterns, don't go for annual rainfall, look at, or look at annual rainfall, but split it up, June to May. Did anyone know that? Pretty simple little rule of thumb. So that's a big one. And that's governed pretty well by El Nino Southern Oscillation, so I'll speak something about that in the next 20 minutes or so. And, uh, and of course, that's been a major factor in, in the weather patterns over the last and climate patterns since June of last year. Then you have interannual and biennial patterns every two years or so, something called the quasi biennial oscillation. Anyone heard of the quasi biennial oscillation? One. <laughs> one person. So it doesn't get much airplay in the country life, I don't know why. It uh, doesn't have the same ring about it as other patterns, but quite important. Then we have decadal and interdecadal patterns which run sort of 10, 20 year timescales, something called the interdecadal Pacific Oscillation, which, can, which used to be fairly well uh, on time, but over the last 30 years have um, not quite run to time. And multi-decadal sort of systems and a bit of climate change as well. So when discussing this really maybe in a climate change talk or other talks, it's, I like to say it's not a matter of is it climate variability or is it climate change, it's a bit of both, it's all going on there at the same time. So it's good fun trying to um, disaggregate this of course, what's causing what, climate change might have an aggravating effect on some of these other patterns, but by and large the, the list we've got down the right hand side there sum up most of our climate patterns that we have to contend with. Certainly in northeast Australia, there's something else called the Southern Annular Mode that affects southwest Western Australia and parts of Victoria. Um, there's um, the latitude of the subtropical ridge, which actually operates in decadal timescales. So there's a few more of them. So it's a complex system, yeah, that we're working with. And uh, perhaps a simple look as well, James Risby did this, is to look how they split themselves around Australia. Oh, you can't see too, it's washed out a bit on the screen, but you can see ENSO out of the tropics, which is the main one, the Madden Julian Oscillation coming through the top end of Australia, but which can extend a cloud band over this part of the world in winter and spring quite easily as it comes through the tropics. The Indian Ocean Dipole, a little bit of uh, suspicion about how much that exists by itself or whether it's a feed in from El Nino Southern Oscillation. And then James has put in Southern Angular Mode down south and some of the weather systems that interact with these sort of patterns. However, the, um, one of the first take home messages is that climate variability in Eastern Australia and the Northern Cropping Belt is largely driven by the conditions in the tropical or equatorial Pacific Ocean. 
So we hear a lot about the risks. It gets, I think, a little bit sidetracked sometimes about uh, what's driving our system. Neville Nichols, um, I call the grandfather of climate research in Australia. I think he's younger than me. But, uh, um, he's at Monash University now, used to be in the Bureau of Meteorology, forces into me some years ago that never forget that the tropical Pacific out there where the international date line meets the equator, OK? Which is this area in here. Okay, this is a key driving force. This is back in October of 1988. And you can see then we had uh, warmer than normal sea temperatures around the Australian coast, especially the Coral Sea, contrasting with this cooler than normal band of sea temperatures out here in the central and eastern Pacific. That's, that's the infamous La Nina pattern. Looked much the same as that in 2008, 1998, um, 1978, actually, um, which is interesting. This sort of La Nina pattern that that's uh, been quite similar in this last, uh, last year, of course. And then contrasting to this, when I first started looking at this work very closely 20 years ago, um, the opposite type of pattern, which is the El Nino system, this is December 1991, and it pretty well stayed that way for about four or five years, which is uh, warmer than normal sea temperatures, not necessarily reaching the, um, the South American coast, by the way, it just has to be warmer than normal around this area where the international date line meets the equator. It's a key region called Nino 4. That's the critical, critical part to look at. And you can pick these up off the web, of course, look at these on a weekly basis from uh, NOAA, NOAA, uh, the Climate Prediction Centre in the US, and so on. And this links to the circulation above the atmosphere, and you can see the high and low pressure systems change place. This is the Southern Oscillation and our friend, the Southern Oscillation Index. And I will focus, focus on the value of the SOI a little, if I may, in this talk, rather than uh, um, some of the other forecast systems that are around, produced by some of the other agencies. One of the reasons, I don't want to get into this sort of debate about my, my forecast system's better than yours or bigger than yours or something, and, and uh, at least I can talk about some of the systems I've developed myself and critically examine those. Um, but yeah, looking at the Southern Oscillation Index, we had this, had this drawn up many years ago for uh, a little, little book called Bullet Rain, and it's still worth looking at. This is 1973, 74, in November 1973. Um, the Southern Oscillation Index was plus 33, okay, November 73. And uh, this is, this, um, this, is this, pe this period here where we had quite a few La Nina events in the 70s. Then this one here in 1998, 1996, we had a weaker one. We had that plague of, of uh, more El Nino-like activity um, in between. Now we've just had another spike up here. And it's useful, of course, to consider the rates of change in the SOI as well as its absolute value, but it's quite a handy um, mechanism. It's a blunt instrument, as I've been told in the past, but you can do a lot of work with a blunt instrument and, it's, uh, and get some value out of it. A bit like measuring someone's uh, temperature when they're sick, you know, they have a fever. It's a good first way to start looking at this. And something I discovered as well out of the Bureau, that just a simple correlation and correlation isn't exactly the way to use the SOI because it's not a nice linear relationship. But just to emphasise a point that perhaps my colleague Peter Heyman might occasionally bring out, that it doesn't just influence Queensland, you know, it's not a Queensland thing, the highest correlations, 0 0.6, 0 0.7 or so, are, are down here in northern Victoria, southern New South Wales. E.T. Quail in 1929 discovered that. So the Victorian floods, the floods around Shepparton and Albury and so on, and Wagga uh, back in September last year. Um, E.T. Quail in the 1920s could have told you that, based on the relation with the SOI and Darwin pressure. But you see a lot of the cropping belt here, the northern belt, it's got a nice linear, a nice uh, correlation. As I said it's not necessarily a nice linear fit. That's so essentially is eastern Australia and includes northeast Tasmania. That's just a first look at it. The forecasting systems, I'll talk about this one in particular, where we clustered the patterns of the SOI. Uh, it's in um, Stonehammer and Marcus and in Nature, 1996, where we actually uh, also allow for change in values, which could be important in the way the atmosphere responds to changes in the Pacific. Out of that, you can get forecasts like this, which is an example for September, November last year, issued around the end of August, and you can see there were very high, using the system, very high rainfall probability values, about 90% or so, for Northern Victoria, Southern New South Wales, and Queensland, and, and the top end. This is for uh, September, November of last year. So it was ticking over quite well, you might say. It, uh, it started to pick this sort of pattern um, as it should do. It was designed to do just that. We can also run these globally. Um, this is available on certainly the little website we have at University of Southern Queensland, if you want to poke in there. But um, um, it also shows for things like commodity trading and what might happen to prices. In the same pattern we had um, through last year, which showed high, very high rainfall probabilities for eastern Australia, also picked the same for southern Africa, um, parts of Brazil, 
Uh, but notice just the opposite, the exact opposite to parts of the former Soviet Union and the uh, wheat growing region of China, I believe. So this, and also notice the United States, except for Northern California, which then had an impact uh, because that produced, not surprisingly, quite severe droughts, had an impact on wheat prices, I understand. Notice Kenya and Eastern Africa also operate opposite to the way we do. This is due to teleconnections um, that spread out of the Pacific around the world. So what happens in that central Pacific is the engine room, it's the engine room for a lot of the world's climate. Now, good old Rayman had a go at doing this for um, individual locations, so you can cut it down to um, you know, a point location, a statistical probability distribution. I know it hasn't quite picked up the rapidly rising phase for Dolby, Oki rather, still. It shows, and the greater the, the shift you're getting here, the split, is what I call the coat hanger effect. The more you're shifting those PDFs apart, the greater the skill that should be within the, in the system to, just, to uh, distinguish, um, for example, an early onset of an El Nino will be shown on this distribution. Chance of getting 100 mils, about 20% in Oki. Uh, consistently positive, it's about 70%, something like that. Now, to assess the forecast quality, um, Andrus Potgieter up in Toowoomba um, said this is the one way to do this. Look at the shifts in those distributions, just as I showed in the, uh, the Rayman sort of example. How far are those two distributions uh, shifted apart? You can do that. And also look at the uh, dispersion. That might be long-term climatology and how well uh, does the forecast... Oh, the forecast might be here. The long-term climatology might be here. So looking at how it shifts, shifts the distribution as well. Another way is through validation and verification. This is a tricky ground, but this is one way of seeing, first of all, whether your forecast can stand up in the long term over the last 100 years, perhaps, if you run the system by taking years out or patterns out or months out and running it. Um, one, that's called validation. Verification, I think, is more important. Uh, if you have any budding climate forecasters in the room, verification is where you actually stop the system, say, as this one has been in 1994, and just run it free will without any interference into the modelling process. You haven't interfered with the, with the system at all. How well will it go? That's verification. Validation is where you test it in what's called a hind cast mode. How would, it, how, would you, how would the scores go for different types of years? And you can also produce different tercels, not just whether it's above or below the median, whether it's going to be the lowest one third or the top one third. And this will be an example for last year again. So it showed very high chance of being in the top third of rainfall values. This is called LEPS, Linear Error in Probability Space, for those that are keen. And that picks up whether the system can identify extremes, how, and it rewards it for picking extremes or um, punishes it for um, not getting the extremes. So you can see the forecast system, such as the SOI phases, as these are called, does well in anywhere that's green through this period of the year, October to December, through this pattern, right? And especially well in northern Queensland. That's how you do this assessment. When you look at this, this is just the SOI phases. I can show afterwards um, other forecast systems for those interested. This is um, a slightly more sophisticated way of using the SOI. There's, uh, these are the hit rates. Now you're just using verifi um, verification scores. You're just running it in free willing mode, just free willing mode now. Well, over all seasons and all years, you can see that any area that's shaded red it's doing far better than climatology, just tossing a coin if you just knew your long-term climate records. So that shows up well for um, the Central Highlands, for those folks from Central Highlands using this system right, overall. And certainly Northern Victoria, Southern New South Wales, New England Tableland, bit patchy around here. This is all seasons, all months, all years. This is an aggregate. It doesn't do very well in the central west of West Australia, but surprisingly well in northwest um, uh, the Gascoigne region, the Gascoigne Murchison up around the northwest shelf. You go to May, July, you get to see it's much more speckledy and poorer pattern, although there's a little area around here on the Liverpool Plains. Uh, this is using the April forecast for May to July, so you know this end of April. Not very well over eastern Australia at all. When you get to June to August, you're getting into the core winter cropping season, I would hazard to suggest it's doing far better now for northern, and you can see that, northern New South Wales and parts of southern Queensland, not so much up into the northern parts of Australia, of course it's dry season anyway, but doing quite well in, in, um, in Victoria. The Bureau of Meteorology ran this, by the way, for us, the National Climate Centre, so this is independently analysed. Um, if we go to the July to September period, then you can see it has its highest skill through that late winter spring period, up to 70, 85%, I think, success rate. This is over the last 10 to 15 years. That makes sense? So it depends on the time of the year. Does these systems do quite well, designed to do well actually, thanks to Graham Hammer and Co. to make sure we I had a system that would pick up the start as best we could 
um, through this June to August period, um, at least in some respects, but certainly comes, comes into play as you get further into, into spring. Now, this is uh, taking, this is aggregating it on a time scale. Um, and well, I guess we'll concentrate on the percent correct or the, the verification. Again, we're just running it in free wheel. And, you, and if it's below the 50% line, it's not doing too well. You could, it's still picking up 20, 30% of occasions, but you could probably do better just, just looking at long-term climatology. So that picks up about 65, 70% of years since 1997, 98, where the forecast system, this is just for Queensland we're looking at here, does better than knowledge of climate. That's a modest output. I would have preferred it would have been a bit better. Um, but something else shows up here, you might notice, that occasionally the forecast systems can do extremely well. Um, through the very recent period, we're in here, um, you can see that, this is um, getting into 2011, 100% correct, which is incredible, I guess. This is just in, this is 100% of the state of Queensland, it was predicting whether it would be above or below the median, and whether it got above or below the median. I'm not looking at extremes here. But also these other periods in here in time, can you just see those? You can see those circles there that are also showing remarkably high skill. And that's an interesting observation I've learned from. This is the Bureau of Meteorology who've done this for us. So the forecast systems can earn their keep, if you like, in certain periods. They're roughly two years apart, which intrigues me for other reasons, but they're also um, associated with um, the well-known El Nino and La Nina periods. And the start, just the start as they're starting to develop around April, May, June, and then through the season. So the start of the 1998 wet if you can remember that and what it did to the, um, I think it did to the wheat crops, no, winter crops around here, uh, which was breaking out of an El Nino and going to La Nina. Uh, the 2002 uh, El Nino event, the 2004 uh, events, uh, 2006 event, 2008 event and so on, 2000 and, uh, and, and eight year, and now recently. It can dive in between. So there's an interesting, interesting um, question here is whether I'm not sure about this, whether we only turn our forecast systems on for this part of the world, and the same applies to New South Wales, just by the way, you can have some periods here that do extremely well. Um, other times it's not doing well at all. The periods it does well, not surprisingly, since it's tuned to picking up the big El Nino and La Nina events in the first place, um, that it should do well then. But whether we should only use forecasts and rely on them when we know we're running into an El Nino, which is a bit of a conundrum, which you can find out because often this system will actually give you that hint just as we're starting off. Then when it locks in, it picks up the nuances through the rest of the year. So we would have done the same last year. Um, as we're going into, um, you see this big swing here in success rate as we're coming out, just coming into winter, the success rate really started to take off. So it picks up the nuances then for the next 12 months. So if we went to um, what the Bundaberg Mail called an El Normal year, um, in not a La Nina or La Nina, um, would you then switch it off? Because it will just flop around all over the place. So that's a question, perhaps. But that's an intriguing, I think, result. So it works well if you get the big El Ninos and La Ninas, not much in between. However, the future, since this is a little bit about um, um, uh, the, the basics of climate forecasting, probably these dynamical climate models. Four main components where they, they actually pick up all the interaction between the, the ocean and the atmosphere and the ice surface and uh, uh, polar ice, which is a, a key feature, and they run on 30-minute time steps, so they can be on global grids. So these are going back to first principles. They're actually running weather forecast models, in a sense, on a slightly different uh, scale, out to three or six months ahead. For those that are interested, I, I'm going to go through this briefly, they have a resolution up to 40 kilometres in the atmosphere of 38 levels, so about a, every kilometre up under the atmosphere, and about uh, 1.8 by 1.25 degree grid. Ocean resolution, something similar. These are, this is a very good one out of the UK Met Office, and I'll briefly mention that the Maggie Thatcher back in the 80s put a lot of money into the Hadley Centre, which is now one of the best climate modelling groups in the world, and actually produces, I think, better climate models for Australia than we produce for ourselves. There's a lot of investment went into, um, into core climate modelling then. And also, they've picked up decadal patterns here, um, and they're starting to run 10-year forecasts, which I'll get into in a minute. Not quite the same sort of discrimination, but uh, still that capability to go forward. So these are picking up, if you like, that capability not only to factor in the importance of El Nino and La Nina and our favourites, 
but also those in between years where other systems such as the Southern Annular Mode or goodness knows what else might be, or the QBO or something like that might be having a role. So this is sort of output they're already getting. This is ECMWF. If you want to Google it and have a look around, European Centre for Medium Range Weather Forecasting. It's in Reading in the UK. Now this is for November, December, January last year, issued in, on the 15th of August. And you see that dark red, purpley mass over Australia, you can pick that out there, 100% chance of getting above normal rainfall. It was picking up for the summer, which is pretty emphatic, I suppose. They've had 41 ensemble size members to that run. So it's picking up all the basics of the global circulation, all the temperatures around Australia, all the other little things that are going on, and come, come out with that result, which is pretty good. The sea temperatures, uh, um, they're showing, they're getting above, oh, we can see the El Nino influence in the, the La Nina influence in the Pacific there. Sorry, but see Australia itself, everyone see that? See that big mass of blue down there? Massively high rainfall probability values. Now, because um, there's interest in winter cropping, of course, um, I had a look back to see how well, this is only an N of one, uh, the August to October period uh, of 2010 was picked up. This is back in the 15th of April. So you're getting some lead. 70% probability of getting above normal rainfall for that end of winter, spring period, just as an example. So the ECMWF, if you're interested in having a poke around on the computer there, um, you can have a look at all these. It's worth following, I think, and also to see as a background pattern to using something like the SOI to get into finer detail, picking up, as I say, the nuances of, of um, local variations and uh, month by, or season by season variation. Having a broad brush look this way ahead, was that useful back in April, knowing that? It's, are you making decisions then? Yeah. Or is it still not early enough? So 15th of April, ECMWF, had a very clear signal for Australia, uh, for Eastern Australia, of, of a very high risk of above normal rainfall. That's before the winter season got going, of course. For temperature as well, they did the same output. This is two metre temperature above, uh, above the ground, which had very low, high, very, very low chance of getting above normal temperatures for, for the November, December, January period. Now going out to, uh, this is a bit, um, you're seeing some secrets here, I guess. The UK Hadley Centre in the UK have a, a 10 year um, program, they think, well, you know, for strategic planning purposes, a 10-year horizon might be useful. So this forecast system is called Depressus, not Depression, Depressus, Decadal Predictive System. And what they showed was, or well, the way you read this, on the right-hand side, if you just take the initial conditions in any year and just, just run those forward uh, one or two years later, you know, what's the correlation between your actual conditions and what they're going to be like in two years? Actually, there's a slight correlation there, but it's not much. If you're on the Depressus system, you go out to a year, the, and the way you read this, the more red the colour, the higher the, this is just correlation, the correlation values. So you're getting very high correlation values over eastern Australia and northeast Brazil yet again. It looks like El Nino country, really, um, or La Nina country. So they're getting a very good signal a year out, but also two years out. If you look further down, this is down here. Um, down, this is Chris Gordon's work out of the UK and uh, Chris Follins. Um, you can see that red area there through Pakistan, India, but also Australia, having reasonably high correlation values two years out. And that's an interesting development. This is purely, this is not statistical at all. These are purely based on no, a thorough knowledge of the atmosphere and the oceans and the processes that take place in between and converting that into rainfall, okay? So it's a handy little system. You can, you can Google this or whatever, look up Depressus and you'll come across the papers um, from the Hadley Centre in the UK. Now locally, the same sort of approach uh, is uh, through the POAMA, this is the Bureau of Meteorology System, which, can you believe, 80%, 90% of which is going to be fed from the UK model, because it's so good, so they're going to buy it, and uh, rather than reinvent the wheel. This is looking at the September-November period last year, uh, at the end of, at the beginning of, um, beginning of the first day of September, so it's picking up um, that slab of rainfall in blue and green is showing high rainfall values in millimetres, millimetres a day, which intrigues me because one of the challenges here, um, talking to someone from Apsaroo before, is with the statistical systems, we found a way of linking it into crop simulation models. If that's, it's just, so over a three month period, if you've got five, let's say two millimetres a day over 60 days as your rainfall likelihood, is that any good for a simulation model? It's not showing the the timing of that, it just gives you a broad brush view. It's an interesting way they've 
they produce the output. But anyway, it's showing above, it's showing reasonably high rainfall for that period, September, November. So you can find this on the POAMA website, P-O-A-M-A. And then they can also, though, and this is experimental stuff, cut that down just to one month. This is the month of March 2011, produced in, on the 17th of February um, last month, just for one month. And again, it's showing reasonably high rainfall through this region and on the Queensland coast, you can see that, in the eastern coast of New South Wales, just for one month, which might be handy as well. I'm not sure if that has any value, just to know a monthly forecast as opposed to a three-month forecast, and also around the northwest of Western Australia. So it's worth watching this. This is just for one month, uh, produced back in February for this month we just entered now. But also the intra-seasonal, this sort of two-week period that, that might be related to the Madden Julian Oscillation up in the tropics. This is showing the 3rd of March, the 17th of March, was produced in, back in mid-February. And yet again, it's showing high rainfall values uh, in what, what they do on their scale for this region, for southeast Queensland, eastern New South Wales. See that there? So this is some interesting new work based almost entirely on, well, is entirely on um, dynamic climate uh, uh, modelling, which is different to the statistical systems you're used to, which I think still have their value, but this is some interesting new work to tantalise us. However, I learned this from someone called Graham Hammer many years ago, seasonal climate forecasting has no value unless it changes the management decision. And that's the challenge, which I'm not going into today, just talking about the climate bits. I think these gentlemen on the right are from Bungunya, I do believe, but uh, I took this back in 1992. So how do you link this into something like AppSim or management systems? And the engineering and output from these new climate models have to be produced in such a way that they can link into these sort of decisions or link into the crop and pasture simulation models. That's the next challenge, which perhaps Peter's going to speak about a bit. So conclusions, if you can see all those. The equatorial Pacific out there where the equator meets the international date line has the dominating role, the dominating role. So if you're thinking about the Indian Ocean and funny places, don't forget the central Pacific. In influencing climate forecast model development and output, and this affects our temperatures and pressure values such as the SOI, ENSO, which is El Nino Southern Oscillation, for Eastern Australia. Use of these Pacific Ocean indicators in statistical models, which has been our mainstream seasonal forecast approach so far, fairly sophisticated actually, also have value in the re relatively easy integration into crop simulation models. So they've, they've won their way into, um, into models such as AppSim. Um, which, was, which was interesting work. They've had modest success since their incorporation in 1992. Um, but they're, they're seasonally specific in, and have value in certain times of the year. And there's still this issue about how do you use probabilistic information um, in the broader community by growers. And I thought it was noteworthy these systems score well. How well do they actually pick season by season in the lead up and during ENSO events, El Nino, Southern Oscillation, La Nina type events. So the question is, should we turn them off when there's no ENSO? Um, and when, you, when we've turned them on, then, then they're worth, very much worth watching. Perhaps that's, that's a, a question. We went through this debate back in the late 80s and decided to keep them going, but um, the results are suggesting perhaps we do the other way. Um, the statistical climate forecast incorporating SST data, that's sea surface temperature data from other oceans, I haven't showed this so far, such as the Indian Ocean, have not fared so well in Eastern Australia. Um, I have to say that, but have scored well in the Western Australia. Um, but most investment these days, just to capture all this, particularly if you want to throw in a tiny little bit of climate change, is in this coupled ocean atmosphere general circulation modelling, which you can pick up off the web, and I think they're the way to go. How you feed them into um, um, crop simulation models and other systems is another matter and verification of these systems um, is certainly underway. So with homage to the Central Pacific, um, I thank you very much. What have you worked out what's driving the absolutely poor success ones? The ones that are way down the bottom, and quite often you look at those, they're going straight up to nearly 100% success rate. What, what, what yeah, had a look at a few of those. One was the early break to the El Nino uh, in, in early 2010. So, and this is an interesting point. Because you could argue also, uh, if you've got a distribution that says, well, 70% of years you get above the long-term median or above 200 mils, 30% of years you know you don't. You should expect 30% of years to give you dry conditions and 70% of years to give you wet conditions. Should you penalise the forecast system because 
Um, all this doing is giving you, like medical odds, giving you a distribution saying 30% of people survive, 70% of people don't, or 70% of people. So should you penalise uh, a system that gives you the entire story? Or is it better to have a system that nudges up to 70, 80, 90%, but you're still going to have 10% of years that does the other way? So that was, the answer to that one is it's usually an early breakout of a major system that causes the system to fail. Then it picks up again very quickly, interesting enough. It catches up. It's like, ah, the system's moved. So within a month, this is, these scores jump back up again because it, it had learnt over that month what had gone on. So it can pick it up. It only takes a month. So that's essentially what's going on. But then you've got a whole distribution you're describing, and this is the value of the work done in Toowoomba, I notice, over the years. Not even things like Rain Man, you are forced to look at the entire distribution. And that's, so it's worth looking at that as well. Roger, if we're wanting to get a bit of an idea for what's going to happen through this winter season, rather than, say, May, March, like, through till September, what should we be looking at? First thing is, I would, this is my own trade secret, if you like, go to ECMWF, the European Centre, uh, that has, the, in my opinion, the best model output for Australia with that sort of lead time, and follow that. You'll get those sort of red and blue maps as a first indicator. Um, then, as we get closer into winter, start picking up on, on aspects such as the SOI and use the two together. So that the, the way to work, in my opinion, the way to work through this, certainly in these years, is to use the general circulation models, such as the UK or the Australian models, to give you a good first broad brush look, and then use the SOI, especially when you get to when it has skill from June onwards, uh, use that to fine tune it. Go to ECMWF as the first port of call. There's others out there, of course. Uh, there's IRI in the United States and a few others, but uh, and the Paima model that's experimental out of out of Australia that uses a lot of the UK modelling, but I think ECMWF is good as any. Yeah, thanks, Graham. It's um, again uh, those new GCMs. If you partition them up, they have more than just um, just those broad brush views. You can actually go in and what's the probability of being in the top 20% of the distribution? And it was extreme. It was the highest you could possibly have last year. Just by the way, it's because the La Nina event was so intense. The Coral Sea is the hottest sea temperatures in the Coral Sea were the hottest recorded. That's only going back to 1900, but it set the scene uh, for a lot of tropical air to come come over Eastern Australia and it did what it should do. So the European models picked that up and picked up the extremes as well. Otherwise you go back to the distributions, which still like the probability distributions associated with the SOI. Normally the chance of getting say two or three hundred mils in emerald we might say might be five percent in any one year. I think in the year we've been through it went up to 40 percent, something like that. Oh, I'm, I'm not sure if it's emerald, but other places it showed that sort of shift. So I think to say 40 percent, that's not enough. But if you turn it the other way around, it's, it's eight times the normal risk. Can I ask, that information was available, how come we didn't heard about that? I don't recall hearing that. Those sort of numbers, that sort of information being distributed anywhere from either primary producers or local or state governments or anybody. Yeah, I've retreated into the, into the quiet world of academia, so um, for all sorts of reasons. Um, it was certainly on our website in the uh, University of Southern Queensland. But there's another reason, I think. One is I was speaking to uh, um, Robin McConkie from Country, I don't know if anyone knows. Oh, yeah, Country, yeah. She said, oh, look, we've done you to death, you and Sid Plant and a few others. We've got to get other people to speak about this. So people get sick of hearing from you or something. So there's the media stuff is, uh, is, well, we've heard enough of these guys. Let's find someone else to speak about it. So there's any media people in the room. So you don't get a chance to even speak about it, which is an interesting issue. I think also, in my opinion, Mr Chairman, I think the extension services around the states have um, diminished. I don't know what they've done since uh, DPI doesn't even exist as an entity, I don't think. But back in the 90s, 1990s, we had a big extension, as you're probably aware, system that would have carried this through automatically into the workshops. I don't know whether those workshops are still running. Managing for climate weather and climate, managing for climate and weather workshops, they were called. And PD used to do similar things. So these are the sort of things I'm talking about now would end up in a workshop in Capella or in, in, um, in Tamworth, 
uh, within a couple of weeks and get filtered through to the community. I don't think that's happening anymore, so that's another problem. But also, there's one more. Everyone's talking about climate change, which is, which is fine, uh, but certainly that's an horrible thing. It's not sexy much anymore to talk about things like we've got a major La Nina. Uh, the media switched off to a lot of this, in my opinion. 